Greetings and salutations, friends. Let me tell you about the Mind Flayers, or Illithids, if you prefer. They are a race of vaguely humanoid-looking monsters. Tall and spindly, they are possessed of two legs and two arms, but only four fingers, tipped by lengthy claws. But by far their most distinguishing feature is their head. Their visage takes the form of an octopus, with four lengthy tentacles flowing down the front of their face and surrounding a small, rounded mouth filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth. And the difference between the lithids and other humanoid beings does not stop with their alien exterior. They are creatures both off this plane and not quite off this reality. They once existed on multiple different planes of reality and can travel between them at will, though these days they have fallen far from grace indeed, and are mostly sequestered away in the deep dark caverns of the Underdark. And due to their peculiar nature, their minds also function differently from those of humans. They are attuned to the presence of geometrical shapes in everyday life, being able to draw meaning and reason from even the most seemingly innocuous of patterns. This ability is almost certainly a holdover from their heydays as interplanar beings, where crossing the space between realities would require a mind able to appreciate realities beyond that of our own fixed form. This unique perspective upon the world has also gifted the Illithids with powerful psionic abilities, being able to outright stun other creatures with powerful mind blasts, or even make other creatures vulnerable to suggestion, to charm, or even outright psionic enslavement. And when you couple these abilities with a deranged, twisted mind bent upon nothing but domination and the devouring of other species, the Mind Flayer is a terrifying foe indeed. But they do have their weaknesses. Due to the peculiar fashion in which their minds work, they perceive light in a very different way from most creatures. They view light as something malicious and harmful, and exposure to strong light can inflict considerable pain on a Mind Flayer. Scant mercy though that may be, to the Mind Flayer's victims, as it fastens its tentacles around their heads after stunning them with a Mind Blast, and begins sucking their brain straight out of their skulls. For this is another interesting facet of their biology. They can only survive whilst continuing to devour the brains of certain other living beings. The list include humans, Githyanaki, Gitsraki, Grimlock, Gnolls, Goblins, Orcs, and of course Elves of all kinds. And those races that were generally not considered edible by the Mind Flayers, such as Ogres, Quagoths, and Troglodytes, were instead enslaved used as servants, labourers, and soldiers of the Mind Flayer colonies. For the Illithids are not mere mindless monsters, driven purely by instinct. They once had a fairly sophisticated society, although most traces of that has these days disappeared in favour of an entirely more servile nature. But once upon a time, the Illithids had a vast and powerful empire. They were, by most accounts, the ruling species of the Inner Plains. Having constructed a vast and complex civilization able to cross between the various realms themselves, utilizing vast biological ships driven by magical and psionic energies known as nautiloids. And you may naturally expect that such a domineering and aggressive civilization would be equally aggressive towards the other realms, but interestingly enough, you would be mistaken.
The Nautiloids were not vessels of conquests, but rather vessels of trade and travel, though there were also those within Mindflayer civilization that used them for far more offensive purposes, in which case one or more Nautiloids would be combined into large ships of offensive conquest known as Dreadnoughts. But a society built upon the backs of slaves forever rests upon an unstable foundation. Few indeed are the species of the cosmos that will happily remain in servitude forever, and whilst slave uprisings were far from an unusual occurrence, the Mind Flayers by and large paid them no heed. Their psionic abilities allowed them to put down virtually any revolt almost instantaneously by simply just expanding their psionic control over the slaves and making them docile once again. Then they could execute a few of the most disruptive elements, and delivering a poignant lesson to the survivors that there was simply no point in rising up against their masters. But the very ease with which they continued to crack down upon revolts eventually led, unavoidably so, to complacency. If the slaves were no real threat, then taking precautions against them was really not worth the time, the effort, or the resources. If the entire slave population could once again be made subservient with so little effort, why prepare? And as this attitude stretched into the millennia, eventually their slave races began to develop a certain resistance to the Mind Flayer's psionic gifts. And one race in particular, the Gith, developed a real talent for nullifying the mind controlling abilities of their oppressors. And since the Mind Flayers had long since discounted even the possibility of an effective slave uprising, their servants were placed under very little scrutiny, and the Gith were able to get organized and coordinate with each other right beneath the tentacled noses of the Mind Flayers, until they rose up in a sudden violent rebellion, catching the Illithids entirely by surprise. And as they prepared to squash this rebellion, as they had done countless others, they found to their horror that their mind-controlling abilities were no longer as effective. The Gith would not stop. They would not be subdued, and they would not lay down their weapons. Weapons that were growing disturbingly close to the Mind Flayers' own residences. And the Gith were not about to return the favour that the Mind Flayers had done them by allowing them to organise. In the span of but a single year, the once vast and great Mind Flayer Empire was rendered asunder and reduced to ruin, with only a few thousand Illithids being able to escape, desperately fleeing out into the other realms and escaping the vengeance of those they had once oppressed. After having ruled tyrannically over such a vast territory for thousands of years, in a mind-numbingly short period of time, the Mind Flayers went from being the alpha predators of the plains to being nothing more than desperate, hunted, and scattered remnants forced to flee out to the far reaches of the cosmos from which they would desperately begin to rebuild. And they also found it necessary to surrender their independence. Another aspect of the Mind Flayer's existence is that they exist as a form of a hive mind. During their heydays, they were allowed a great deal of individuality, where each Mind Flayer was by and large the master of his own faculties, although he could still communicate uninterrupted and without any problem with other Mind Flayers around him. They could even relay messages from one end of their massive empire to another via psychic relays. But with their very species pushed to the brink of extinction by the vengeful Gith, 
who were showing no signs of calling off their hunt for the Mind Flayers, they decided that it would be best to surrender the future of their species to the most mentally powerful amongst them, and let the most intelligent guide the species, in the hopes that their superior mental acumen would find a way to survival. And those creatures were an entirely different kind of Mind Flayer, known as the Elder Brains. The Elder Brain is a vast, amorphous entity vaguely resembling a gargantuan brain, whose massive, fleshy form is in turn made up of hundreds if not thousands of smaller brains of dead illithids. Once a Mind Flayer reaches the end of its natural life, or expires due to violence imparted upon it by the vengeance of the lesser races, they join their minds, and brains specifically, to the Elder Brains through a ritual. This is seen as an almost holy thing by the Mind Flayers and if a fallen Mind Flayer's brain cannot immediately be joined to an Elder Brain, it is placed in storage inside a so-called Brain Canister, a highly ornate funerary jar inscribed with the history, the story and the exploit of the Mind Flayer interred within. Mind Flayer Society views this as a way of joining their consciousness with the greater mind of the Elder Brain, and they view it as a form of immortality, where their spirit, their essence, their intellect can continue to exist for all eternity as a part of a greater whole. What Mind Flayer Society at large does not know, however, is that once a Mind Flayer's brain is joined with that of an Elder Brain, the Elder Brain's personality becomes dominant, and essentially quashes out the lesser intelligence and personality of the newly joined Mind Flayer Brain, subsuming it into a greater whole indeed, but also crushing any personality and any individuality beneath the bulk of a far greater mind. And this destruction of the individual continues beyond this point as well, for after their fall from grace, the Mind Flayers have essentially submitted themselves to the complete will and control of the Elder Brains. These days, most Mind Flayers exist within colonies of everywhere from between a thousand to four thousand Mind Flayers, who are all de facto the brain dead puppets controlled by the Elder Brain. They may have a vague illusion of independence, but in reality they are nothing more than slaves to a far more vast and controlling intelligence. Though this is not to say that they are incapable of independence, indeed on occasions of particular importance, groups of Mind Flayers may be allowed to leave the colony on missions that the Elder Brain consider so vital and so valuable that it is willing to risk losing influence over those Mind Flayers. In this case, they are organised into small groups of parties known as Inquisitions. This is a group of a handful of Mind Flayers sent out from the colony to achieve a very specific objective. Once they leave the colony, they are free from the overriding influence of the Elder Brain. This could of course cause them to decide that they are better off somewhere else in a more independent capacity, but if they break away from the colony, they do become apostates, heretics almost, and they lose the ability to join their minds to the Elder Brain, and bearing in mind that they view this as a form of immortality for them, that is a great sacrifice that most may not be willing to make, unless of course they learn of the truth. And since that risk is ever present, the Elder Brains will rarely allow its slaves to leave the colonies. 
Though on occasions, even more important objectives may arise, things that might vastly increase the power of the Elder Brain, allowing it to spread its influence or gain access to some particularly powerful artifact. In these cases, where a mere inquisition will not be enough to achieve the objective, it may form a so-called cult. This cult is a larger group of mind flayers sent out into the world, often for extended periods of time, to take control, frequently, over mortal colonies as well. As their objectives are often many years, if not decades, in the making. This is of course an extraordinarily risky thing for the Elder Brain to do, as separating itself from its servants for years upon years, well, the inquisitive nature of the Mind Flayers and their sudden independence can be quite alluring indeed. But to mitigate the risk, the cult is controlled by two individuals, not one, and these two Mind Flayers are expected to constantly be at odds with one another. And since the Elder Brain knows the minds of its servants better than even they do, it has no real problems to pick two individuals that could simply never quite get along. They will cooperate enough to fulfil their objective, hopefully, but not enough to ever come to a true accord with one another. It is a constant and precarious balance for the Elder Brain to maintain the subservience of his Mind Flayers whilst also expanding his own influence, keeping the community safe and acquiring the necessary resources to keep it thriving. Each Mind Flayer will have to consume one brain of a sentient creature every month and they will die if allowed to go without that sustenance for three months. As such, a colony of a thousand Mind Flayers will require a thousand victims every month just to keep it healthy, and to keep it truly happy and content, a considerably larger quantity would be needed. This means that the Mind Flayer colonies do need to hunt continuously. And to grow the colony, they require yet further sacrifices. For you see, the Mind Flayers procreate in yet another unique fashion. They are asexual and cannot procreate with one another. Instead, each Mind Flayer, once or twice during the span of the 125 years life cycle, will lay a clutch of eggs. This clutch is then placed within the giant briny jar filled with viscous fluid that the Elder Brain floats within. Eventually, the eggs will hatch into small, immature forms of Mind Flayers. These tiny, worm-like creatures are referred to as illithid tadpoles, and as they spend a full decade within the tank, the Elder Brain will devour a vast quantity of them as its sustenance. Those who survive a full ten years, being saturated with the psionic abilities of the Elder Mind and stewing in its juices, eventually become mature tadpoles and can be implanted within a suitable victim. This is done in a process known as ceramorphosis, where the matured tadpole, about the size of a thumb, is placed upon a victim's face. The victim will be a member of one of the various species that is considered edible by the illithids. The tadpole will then enter into the victim's brain by eating its way through the victim's eyeball or burrowing in through nose or ear. Once inside the victim's skull, it slowly begins to devour its brain. Bite by torturous bite, the victim will grow slowly more and more insane as his brain is devoured. And once it has been fully eaten by the tadpole, it will begin taking control of the host's body. Growing, expanding, and extending its wiggly little tentacles throughout its body, transforming what was once a human, elf, or orc, or otherwise, into a fully grown mind flayer. 
This process is strictly controlled, however, by the elder brain. It wishes to keep its colony on just about replacement level, occasionally growing a little bit here and there, but numbers must be kept reasonable, since the elder brain will have to continue to supply food for the colony, and thus making its presence far more obvious to its neighbours. Colonies of mind flayers are rarely tolerated by, well, any species, frankly, and if they see an opportunity to quash it out, they will happily take it. And with the Gith still not having gotten over their grudge against the Mind Flayers, stealth is by far the best option for Mind Flayer colonies. On occasion, however, on a very, very, very rare exception, the creature born from Ceramorphus will not be a mere mind flayer, but instead something known as an Ulithirad, which translates into Noble Devourer. This is a special form of mind flayer born with not four, but six tentacles, and in addition to the two extra wigglies, it is a far more intelligent and malicious entity. And whilst even the lowliest mind flayer is possessed of a considerable ego, with which it considers itself the superior of any other species, the Ulitharid consider themselves as far above the mind flayers as the mind flayers are above the chattel species of the realms. The Ulitharids are also immune to the mind-controlling powers of the Elder Brains. This obviously makes them a massive threat to the controlling interest of the brain in charge of the colony, but generally speaking, the Ulitharids are tolerated, because they are the only way a colony can truly expand out beyond its immediate borders. Since the Elder Brain immediately loses its mind-controlling power over those mind flayers it sends outside of its influence, expanding the colony's borders is not really practical by and large, as independent colonies of mind flayers have a nasty habit of deciding that they wish to remain independent. An Ulitharid, however, is able to mind control a handful of lesser mind flayers much like an elder brain, and will eventually, at the end of its long lifespan of some 250 years, transition into becoming an elder brain itself, thusly creating a brand new colony. And of course, in plentiful time before that happens, the Ulitharid leaves its original colony, with a handful of mind flayers accompanying it. Usually this is done entirely voluntarily, as the Ulitharid will wish its own independence, but on occasion it might also be prodded to do so, since the currently reigning Elder Brain would not be overly fond of such a mighty rival right nearby. And of course, on occasion, the reverse may also happen, where the Olitharid decides that it deserves a more prominent place in society, and the current Elder Brain, well, obstacles will have to be removed, of course, but um, progress must continue. And before we move on from the, uh, frankly, somewhat gross topic of Illithid procreation, there is one further thing we must mention. Whilst implanting a tadpole in the process of ceremorphosis in a human, elf, githnyaki, kitsaraki, grimlock, noel, goblin, orc, or the other species will result in a mind flayer, or on rare occasion in an ulitharid, implanting a tadpole in certain other species may also yield interesting results. For example, one colony experimented with implanting their young in the minds of beholders, creating a very interesting creature known as a mind witness. This particular meld of mind flayer and beholder creates an incredibly powerful psionic entity, able to communicate with any other creature telepathically in its language. 
This makes it extraordinarily valuable as a tool of communication for the elder brains, and are bred for that very purpose. There are several other variations as well, where Mind Flayer tentacles are combined with creatures such as Deep Gnomes, Lizard Folks, or even Dragons to create very… interesting and or horrifying combinations with attributes important and useful to the Elder Brain. They are usually created as specialists and used for very peculiar purposes. For example, a Roper and a Mind Flayer might be combined to create an Urufian used as guards, or Deep Gnomes might be combined with a Tadpool to create spies and infiltrators. These different strains could considerably expand, extend, and specialize the abilities of a colony, but acquiring many of them could also be quite difficult. Holding down a dragon, for example, for long enough to let a tadpole crawl into its eye and devour its brain is not necessarily an easy feat, as you can probably imagine. Now, moving on from the idea of mind flare procreation, let's talk a bit more about the idea of religion. I have mentioned already that they have certain rituals, things they seem to value quite highly, like for example placing the brain of a fallen comrade within a funerary jar, so that it may eventually be reunited with the elder brain, or how they view the process of ceremorphosis like a ritual, like something with a higher purpose. And this is certainly correct, but the Mind Flayer's view on religion is not quite as straightforward as those of the other races that may worship certain deities. Instead, the Mind Flayers worship an idea, an ideal, you might even say, a manifestation of their own psionic potential. Whether or not these things can be called true deities is somewhat up to interpretation, but their powers certainly resemble those of the accepted deities, even going so far as to be able to give certain divine abilities to their worshippers, and some even being able to grant these boons to non-mind flayers. The most commonly worshipped one is Il Sensini, the embodiment of mastery of one's own mind and universal knowledge. The precise interpretation of this semi-deity varies wildly from colony to colony. Some view it as the ideal of pursuing knowledge to acquiring universal and flawless understanding of the world. Other views it as a promise of domination, that through a perfect mind you will gain perfect dominance over others, whilst yet others again view it as an entity capable of granting these boons and benefits onto its worshippers. An idea that would be considered quite enticing for many other species beyond the Mind Flayers. A somewhat less common uh, deity of sorts is Ma'an Zikurian, the embodiment of complete comprehension and understanding of all secrets. This is by some interpreted as a reference to the Illithid's ability to communicate with one another and exist as a hive mind, where a secret known by one is known by all, the existence of an infiltrator, for example, or a thief immediately being known to the entire colony, along with his precise location and appearance whilst yet others view this as an innate superiority to other beings, a promise that the Mind Flayers will be in possession of all knowledge and all weaknesses and secrets of the other species, and they can then use this ability to dominate them. Though, bear in mind that this somewhat strange interpretation of religions and deities in the world of D&D is not entirely due to the Illithid's peculiar mindset. They can be affected by more traditional deities, as we have seen with a group of Mind Flayers revering a deity known as Thun. 
This is a warlike entity, and its worshippers are, by nature, also very, very warlike. Now, misunderstand me correctly, the Mind Flayers are certainly an aggressive species by nature, but they are not necessarily warlike. They prefer to dominate, to control, and to enslave other species, whilst the worshippers of Thun have a far more straightforward objective. They are there to conquer, to destroy, to annihilate, and to subject the other species. Dominating them and enslaving them, they are not so much goals in and of themselves as potential side benefits of their main activity. And finally, let's talk a little bit about the abilities of the Mind Flayers themselves, why they are such ferocious creatures. For after all, they are somewhat spindly. They are possessed of a mere four fingers, except for the noble of Ryan's with five. And they are not exactly physically imposing. And indeed, if you got into a brawl with one, you would probably have a decent chance at success. But, of course, whilst their physical forms might be weak, their psionic prowess is mighty indeed. They are able to stun most creatures with a mind blast, rendering them insentient for more than long enough for the mind flayer to simply calmly walk up, grapple the victim, place its four tentacles lovingly on its head, and begin sucking out its brains. This ability alone, the ability to stun a target, and indeed multiple targets as the Mind Blast is a conal ability, makes the Mind Flayer a very dangerous opponent. But that is of course not all. This is an ability best used from ambush, since the spindly form of the Mind Flayer means that it will not appreciate an enemy hitting it first, or peppering it with ranged abilities or magic of the target's own devising. But aiding the Mind Flayer in ambushing its targets is its ability to detect the thoughts and mind activity of other intelligent creatures, making it aware of when a potential victim is nearby. This telepathic link can also allow the Mind Flayer to attempt to dominate or charm the creature, either forcing it to become an unwilling puppet to the Mind Flayer's will, or making it think that maybe, just maybe, the Mind Flayer isn't such a bad creature after all, and maybe you should get a little bit closer. More powerful and experienced Mind Flayers might also be able to hone their psionic abilities to replicate the effects of a wide variety of spells, including the ability to use telekinesis, to cast confusion spells, and even some from the schools of divination. Indeed, this ability to replicate the effect of many spells through their psionic abilities have led the Mind Flayers to view the arts of arcane magic as a lesser thing, as almost a corrupted form of their own psionic abilities, and something not truly necessary in the universe at all, really. Something to be eradicated once the Illithids regain their rightful place at the top of all of the other species. But of course, even the most powerful of psionic abilities may occasionally meet its match, or hit a certain limit, as the Mind Flayers learn to their extreme cost during the Gith Rebellion. As such, they have also developed certain abilities to protect themselves, and certain weapons as well. They are able to create psychically linked items, able to damage the mind of an opponent, rendering them insane or insentient. These weapons can also only be wielded by the Mind Flayer itself, or its immediate thralls, as a bit of a safety mechanism. Yet another lesson learned during the Slave Uprising. They have also experimented with certain other abilities, for example with symbiotic creatures, creating living suits of armour, or living alongside creatures able to shield them against certain attacks or certain effects. Creating living space suits, for example, allowing the Mind Flayer to operate in the cold nothingness of the Void. 
technically speaking, as long as there is a creature out there capable of the feat that the Mind Flayer wishes to replicate, there is very little, if any, limit to what a Mind Flayer could potentially achieve. This unsurprisingly makes them extraordinarily dangerous foes, and a noble Mind Flayer even more so, and if you were to happen across an Elder Brain, well, its physical abilities would be even less than that of a regular Mind Flayer, but you really don't want to get caught in its Mind Blast. Not to mention that it would be a miracle if you even get close to it, as an Elder Brain is capable of noticing the thoughts of an intelligent creature from 8 kilometers away. Not exactly something you ambush, to put it mildly. And whilst the Mind Flare Empire lies shattered now, and they are currently being hunted by those they once oppressed, it is far from impossible to imagine that they might rise once again. They may discover some new way to hone their psionic abilities, or some particularly interesting blend of Mind Flayer and Creature that may give them, again, the advantage they once had. And if they ever manage to get back on top, woe betide the other intelligent races of the plains. And so, with that, I'll wrap up this little video on the Mind Flayers. This really was a bit of a just random thought I had after seeing the Baldur's Gate 3 trailer, where I was like, you know, now I gotta talk about the Mind Flayers, because the Mind Flayers are quite interesting little creatures, albeit limited by the nature of D&D, where... Well, they are lawful evil, which means there are no good Mind Flayers. There are no neutral Mind Flayers. They're all just assholes. And also, the way that D&D does lawful evil is something that I disagree with quite vehemently. In my mind, a lawful evil person is not necessarily evil. He could be a person that simply works within the restraints of a system. He could be a person that indeed benefits a majority of people. He could, for example, kick out a family from their home because he's bought the deed to that house, but he might then set up a mercantile shop in that area, leading to greater prosperity for both himself and everyone else. I really do hate the way that D&D just makes evil an actual thing, when evil... you cannot define evil. Nobody considers themselves evil. Evil is not a thing. It is not an existence. It is an extraordinarily amorphous and ill-defined idea used by people who cannot fully articulate why something is evil. But, anyways, I'll wrap up the little end... Uh, video rant there. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much so for watching. If you like the video, do consider sharing it around a little bit. It is very, very helpful to me, and I appreciate it a lot. Until next time, have a good day.